Angela, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us at our latest uh, Future Tense Social. This is very exciting for me because I'm a huge fan of Eric Larson's books. And we all got to, to listen to a little bit of Churchill as we, as we were warming up to get in the mood. Um, my name is Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense, um, which is a collaboration between New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. Uh, we look at the implications, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the impact of technology on society. I'm also a professor of practice at our Cronkite School of Journalism out at Arizona State University. Um, it's really an honor and pleasure to have you with us today, um, Eric. Uh, and what brings us here today is your latest book, uh, The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill family and defiance during the Blitz. As all of you uh, probably know, I'm sure, Eric is also the author of such fabulous books as Dead Wake, In the Garden of Beasts, uh, Thunderstruck, Devil in White City. Uh, I have read uh, most of your books, but I have not read your first book. I was intrigued uh, looking at your biography um, that you wrote a book uh, called The Naked Consumer, How Companies Spy on Individual Consumers, which is actually a very future tensey subject. So maybe we will have you come back and, and talk about that one. I also loved on your website, which all of you should listening should check out. Um, uh, I, I think it's ericlarsonbooks.com. I loved on your website, you have an alternative biography, which is, which is fab fantastic. And you described The Naked Consumer as a book that you really liked, but nobody else did. Um, and I seriously doubt that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at that. Um, so welcome, and really thank you for, for thank having you. us. Thank you for being with us. Um, I think we should just get right to it. And I want to, because we're having this conversation today of all days, I feel like I should ask the question that I'm sure is on everyone's minds, and that is, how did Winston Churchill celebrate Cinco de Mayo? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But That but would I'll, stump me. That would stump me. <laughs> that was, okay. You're like, that was not one of the things we discussed. No, uh, in all seriousness, we are having this event on Zoom as opposed to uh, in person, which I would have loved because um, uh, we're on, you know, lockdown, quarantine, house arrest, choose your, 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 your term in the face of this global pandemic. And so uh, I just want to read a, a, a paragraph from, from your book to, to set, set a scene here. You wrote, uh, Churchill's notion of what constituted an office was expansive. Often generals, ministers, and staff members would find themselves meeting with Churchill while he was in, the bath, in his bathtub, one of his favorite places to work. He also liked working in bed and spent hours there each morning going through dispatches and reports with a typist seated nearby. Always present was the box, a black dispatch box that contained reports, correspondence, and minutes, minutes from other officials requiring his attention, replenished daily by his private secretary. So clearly Winston Churchill was, was, was someone who had mastered the art of working from home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I, is I, something that we're all <laughs> struggling to do these days. And so uh, maybe not the, the place that these conversations about your book usually start, but I'm really curious as to whether uh, you, you think Churchill would, would have some, uh, but, some well, that, your mortals on, on working from home. Let's put it this way. If, if I were Winston Churchill and I were doing the Zoom interview with you right now, I would be in the bathtub. <laughs> I'd be in the bathtub and actually Churchill had no sense of vanity and he very likely would have been completely naked doing it. But you know, he was, uh, he was an ace, uh, an, an ace work at Homer. I mean, you know, the guy would get up relatively late in the morning and he would work in, in bed. Um, uh, he had his, uh, his typist, his personal secretary nearby with a, at all times with a, with a typewriter taking notes. He would more than likely have a, have a cigar and also frankly, more than likely would have a, um, and this is very appropriate for today, uh, would very likely have a tumbler full of, uh, uh, of water and whiskey, very little whiskey in it, but, but nonetheless, a whiskey and water. It's interesting. You talk about, um, we, 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 we tend to think of this, you know, epic relationship, friendship, partnership, alliance, whatever we want to call it between FDR and, and, and Churchill, uh, and the communications going back and forth between Washington and London and, and the, and the summits. Um, but I, I was, it, it, it was interesting reading your book, how a lot of the early conversations in DC when, when Churchill first enters office um, is, 
is about the drinking and sort of some of his, uh, the sort of over the top nature of, of his personality and sort of, I guess people were wondering, is this somebody we can take seriously? Yeah, yeah. Well, drinking, drinking has always been something that people have, have, uh, have, have, have noted about Churchill, but um, it is a mistake to ever think that, that he was a, a drunk or an alcoholic. He certainly was not. In fact, uh, his very close uh, 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 private secretary, John Colville, um, uh, wrote uh, later on that he had never seen Churchill uh, drunk or even in, in any way with his faculties limited by, by alcohol. And Churchill himself once said to Clementine, his Clementine, by the way, he once said to her after she was criticizing him for drinking, he once said to her, he said, I've, I've taken a lot more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me, you know, so that, that's how he felt. One, one thing back to the back to the working at home aspect, you know, one thing that certainly resonates today is that uh, Churchill in this period spent a lot of time at the prime ministerial country home checkers every weekend um, uh, and, and actually later began dividing his time between two two country homes which is what a lot of people are also doing doing now so he, he would have been he would have been uh, very likely quite uh, quite at home with this uh, with this whole situation and, and i was struck that the i i did not know this uh checkers uh was was donated by somebody to the government was that correct as, Our, as a kind of as a Camp David. I mean, it was more of a traditional country home, I suppose. Well, it was an, idea, American, an American who donated it. Arthur it Lee, before the war, well before the war, back in, I, I, I believe he donated it in 1914. Anyway, don't, don't quote me on that one. But anyway, it was, yeah, it was donated to the government, the idea being that checkers was to be used. It, no work was to be done there. This is according That's to Arthur Lee's original name. No work was to be done there. It was a place for, so that prime ministers could sort of just enjoy the, the, the bucolic countryside and, and let their faculties restore. Now, Churchill, of course, uh, took that very, very differently. He decided to make this his, his country command post and right. packed it every weekend with guests and booze and fun. <laughs> um, so I, I have to confess that when, when I first heard that this was the subject of your next book, I was intrigued. I, I feel like I had I had read quite a lot about this 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 first year of Churchill's being in office and and that moment you know the finest hour that Britain faced and the Blitz and so forth. And I think if this you know and I and re recently I read um, I think it was Andrew Roberts's biography of Churchill and and. Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of us are, even if we're, if we're not specialists, we, we have been inundated with books about this, this great historical character. And I might have skipped this book had it not been written by you, because, but I, 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 having read your other books, I, I, I felt like he is going to have a new angle, a new insight, some new framing. Um, but it might, was it daunting at all? I mean, did you read, write about Churchill because you felt like there were too many books written about Abraham Lincoln, or what? What was it that drew you to this subject? <laughs> no, listen, I, I was I was totally daunted. Um, uh, but but let me let me let me, um, uh, let me let me be clear. It was not actually Churchill um, that that drew me to do this book. Churchill kind of became a entered the party a little bit late in the process because what had happened is that. I had, I had decided for a variety of relatively complicated reasons that it would be very interesting to look into how it was that people actually got through the day during, during the Blitz, during the German air campaign, and including that portion we know as, as the Blitz. How did they actually do it? And, and the reason was, I mean, the, the reason was that we had, my wife and I had moved from Seattle to New York City. <clears throat> and, and, and no sooner did I move to New York City than I had this kind of epiphany about what 9-11 had been like for New Yorkers versus what <clears throat> the rest of us who, who perhaps watched it in real time had experienced. I mean, it's just a world, world of difference. This, you know, not just the sense and sights, but also the sense of violation of having your home city attacked. Right. And that's what made me start thinking about writing about the, how people actually got through the blitz. I mean, as you can imagine, 57 consecutive nights of bombing. How did people get through it? My original thought was maybe I'll just, <clears throat> maybe I'll just write about the typical London family. 
So I, I thought about that. Then I thought, wait a minute, why not the quintessential London family, Churchill, his family, his advisors, and see exactly how they got through the day. And, and really much to my surprise, but nobody had actually done that. Nobody had decided to, to take right. a close look at that day-to-day that, that -day experience. Um, and, um, and that's what really helped me get through it. But was I daunted? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Once I realized how much material had been written about Churchill and how much good stuff also. I mean, people like Andrew Roberts, he's my, my favorite of the Churchill scholars, actually. He's a brilliant writer. Um, so much material had been done that I actually early on had to, do a, uh, had to make a strategic decision about how I was going to pursue the research. The idea of, 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 of reading everything that had ever been written about Churchill or by Churchill, which itself would have been a Herculean task, I realized it would be a fool's errand. It would take me. It would take me a decade, and and even then, even then, by the time I got to the, to the tenth year, I wouldn't be done because eight more books would come out about Churchill. So what I did, I had, to, I did, I made a strategic decision that I was going to simply read as much as I could to get a sense of 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 Churchill and the landscape in that period, and then dive right into the archives to see what was really there. That's where I feel most comfortable with it, with, with original materials and so forth. And so that's how I managed to kind of pare things down. Otherwise I would have just been overwhelmed. That's not to say, however, that that every single day for the last four and a half years that I did not in fact ask myself, what am I doing? <laughs> Well, it, it was it was very interesting to, to see the, the how uh, it, it did feel like a, a portrait of, of Churchill's orbit. And you had these you, we were looking we were often seeing Churchill and that historical moment through the eyes of his personal secretary uh, or his daughter or uh, other advisors that sometimes are not quite we don't necessarily see things through their perspective as much and some of the other. Yeah. accounts that I've read. You mentioned Churchill's own writing. I, one of the things that astonished me reading the uh, Robert's biography was I had, no, I had no, I never had realized just how prolific, I mean, I was familiar with the histories he wrote after the war, but the fact that throughout his life, he uh, would always get himself out of financial holes by, by his own writing, and he was so prolific and, and commanded quite, uh, you know, a lot of money for his journalistic writings earlier, uh, yes, yes, yeah, in a yeah, way that I, I had not fully appreciated. Um, and, and ultimately, it was, it was his writing that got him uh, ultimately finally out of, the, out of the, the, the financial hole. But this is one of the things about, about Churchill that is so, so remarkable is that, is that he was extremely well read. He was an extremely talented writer um, and, you know, and also quite good, good painter. But you know, he, 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 all this went into that machine that was, you know, the Chir Churchill's brain and it all really helped him in this process of trying to lead the nation through this, through this particular, through this, the, the, the crisis of that German air campaign. So <clears throat> it's interesting that, that you said you, you gravitated towards this moment by thinking about what it must have been like to be in New York on 9-11 and then sort of multiply that by, you know, uh, 57 nights of, of the Blitz and so forth. Um, and then your book comes out in early 2020. And of course, uh, we are now, uh, the entire world is, 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 is fighting off this global pandemic, which is a, a, an existential challenge to our societies. That's quite different from, from war, although we see people reaching for those analogies. But the analogy that is um, unquestionable is, is the need for uh, leadership, um, to mobilize society to meet, you know, the crisis at hand that requires extraordinary efforts and sacrifices. And so um, I want to ask you about, about that and, and whether there's a secret sauce to Churchill's leadership. But before we even get to that, and you've started alluding to this, but maybe just sort of set the scene, um, you know, May 10th, 1940, uh, amazing day in history. It's where your, your account starts. It's 80 years from this coming Sunday, I was I was also thinking about that in mm. preparation of, of this. So just just sort of set the scene in terms of <clears throat> describing what it was that the the UK and and Winston Churchill uh, were, were were facing. 
Yeah, so 1940, um, which is when the action starts in, 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 in my book, was the day that Churchill became prime minister, the greatest day in his life. I think even he would agree. This is the thing that he wanted most of all. Uh, he became prime minister um, owing to a, uh, something of a rebellion in the House of Commons, um, uh, where the consensus was that Neville Chamberlain, uh, the prior prime minister, was not, was not up to the challenge of dealing with Hitler and, 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 and Germany. But that same day, May 10, 1940, was the day that Hitler went to the so-called phony war, ceased to be a phony war. It became a hot shooting war when, when, uh, when uh, Hitler invaded the Low Countries. So here's this situation where Churchill, is, this is the greatest day of his life, but also one of the darkest um, days in the, in the history of, of the world. This did not daunt Churchill. Churchill thought this simply, this is, this, is like, this is like added spice to the challenge, the idea of being in charge of this, this, of this great empire at, at such a dire time really kind of thrilled him. So, so but he becomes, he becomes um, prime minister, he, he immediately appoints his cabinet, and this is sort of a crucial element also. We can talk about the people he appointed, two of them in particular, who are main characters in this book, who in, in, in I think in other works are, are, have been you know, relegated to simply the, the secondary secondary posture. But he quickly appoints his cabinet, but, but he, he immediately is confronting, we talk about existential threats, the, the presumption at the time was that once, once Germany consolidated its hold over France, you know, the British Expeditionary Force was being expelled. That's what that speech was about, was about the chaos at Dunkirk and so forth. That once France fell, and it seemed quite certain that France was going to fall, that the entire strategic picture had, would, would, would change. Um, prior to, to France falling, the assumption was that France would always stand, that, that, that this um, would keep the, the Luftwaffe at bay because the planes would not be, well, the fighter escorts in particular, would not, be, um, would not have the endurance to fly all the way to, to Britain. Suddenly, with France falling, suddenly there were German air bases on the coast of the English Channel, minutes, literally just, just minutes away from, from England and, and minutes away from, from London, something that planners in Britain had never, had, had never even speculated on. Mm -hmm. So you have, suddenly you had, you had that, that, that threat and, and the very real um, uh, fear that Hitler, that Germany was going to invade in, in, in a cross-channel attack. This seemed to many people, most people at that time, to be a certainty that if Germany ever attained air superiority over the channel, there was going to be an invasion. So if you can imagine taking control of, 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 of Britain taking, at, at this time when not only has Hitler you know, begun invading various countries in, in, in Europe and succeeding and, and just crushing them, um, but now suddenly he's facing what could be an existential threat in terms of an invasion across the channel. I mean, what a, what a hellish uh, prospect for, for any normal mortal, but not, for, not actually for Churchill. He took this on with a, with a verve and a gusto that came through time and time again in subsequent months. And, and you know, we, we were listening to snippets of, of his speech and uh, his oratory, uh, you know, we're all, we've all been exposed to it. Um, and, and there's, there've been lots of Hollywood renditions and <laughs> there's a, uh, and obviously he had a gift uh, with, with the language. Um, but when, when you, when you, when you think of the, the, his recipe for leadership, um, is there, I think there's a tendency to just focus on the oratory and, and that ability to communicate and inspire through, you know, sort of leveraging the English language maybe uh, shouldn't be underestimated, but um, was okay. it mostly that he was a great communicator or how much of the, the, the ratio of, of elements and, and in was his it, success was that? Yeah, well, it, it, was a <clears throat> excuse me, it was a mix of things. First of all, we, I, we're all familiar with, with the oratory, the great lines, you know, there never has so, so much been owed by so many to so few. But I would argue that that's not really the strong point of his, of his speeches. In fact, at the time, that particular line did not necessarily have the same resonance it does now for all of us. You know, it was basically a, 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 a speech. It was just a speech. But the, uh, the thing that, the thing that made, made Churchill, I think, particularly um, uh, excellent at, at communicating not just news and information, but also communicating also a sense of uh, a sense of reason for, 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 for courage is how he structured his speeches. And we got a taste of that at the, at the opening speech of, of, about Dunkirk. 
first of all, he was a great storyteller. And he was telling, as you, as you heard in those opening, those opening moments, he was telling it as a story, as, as this, is, this is what was happening. This is how it was unfolding, sort of a, a thrilling story, if you think about it. But what he would do is he would give you, he would give his audience a sober appraisal of the situation, not, not happy talk, just, just a really down-to-earth sober appraisal, sometimes too sober and too detailed, and then scared the heck out of his <laughs> audience on occasion. But then he would follow with, with comments about, you know, real grounds for why people should be optimistic by, by how this problem of the blitz of, of, of Dunkirk, of, of the potential for a German invasion, how this could be, how this can be, can be resolved. Positive reason for, for, for optimism. And again, not happy talk, real grounds for optimism. And then would come this rhetorical flourish at the end that would metaphorically and perhaps not so metaphorically have people rising from their seats and saying, all right, I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to, we're going to take this guy on, God damn it. And this is, this is how this is going to be. We're going to, we're going to beat, you know, we're going to beat Hitler. That was a very powerful thing. But there's another element to Churchill's leadership, a couple of other elements. One is, and this comes into play also in terms of his ability to communicate, he, he being this, this, this great reader of, of, of history, he had this ability to put people, to place people into, in, into the grand epic of British history, to make them feel as if they were part of this great island story, as he would put it. And that was very important, to make them all feel part of this thing, this, this great tradition that they had to unfold. But also, he had, he had um, a, a real understanding of the power of symbolic acts. And along a continuum, even something as simple as, as, as refusing to call Hitler by his name. He would say that man or that wicked man, which when you think about it, it's a very subtle, very tiny thing, but it's a very powerful thing. If you don't, if you don't identify, if you don't, if you don't, you know, demonize your enemy, it makes him seem a little, you know, like, like, like this, 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 this unimportant presence off in the, off in the distance. But then the under, uh, other end of this continuum, he learned very early on in the Blitz the power of visiting bombed out areas and showing himself there, uh, showing himself, you know, sternly, you know, surveying the damage, talking to people, expressing emotion. He was not afraid at all of, of, of weeping in public, but also showing his resolve simply by, you know, simply by being there. He was, he was engaging in a in a courageous act and was showing showing defiance. And this was a very, very powerful thing. You know, I, just to give you a, a sort of a contemporary example, I mean, I had to laugh in a sort of a grim way the other day when we saw, we saw Vice President Mike Pence at the Mayo Clinic without a mask when everybody else around him was wearing a mask. And, and to think of that, to think of the optics of that, you know, possibly appealing to one's tiny slice of America, maybe, but you know, somebody like Churchill would be wearing that mask, he'd be charging around, you know, saying, this is, this is, this is what we do. Um, you know, that's that, that power of symbolic acts. And, and, and you know, if you, if you engage in symbolic acts that create a dissonance with your audience, like you don't wear a mm -hmm. mask when your audience knows damn well, you should be wearing that mask. That's a problem. That's a problem that undercuts your credibility as a, as a leader. So Churchill had this acute sense of the, of the power of symbolic acts. Another, another example of that, by the way, is that, you know, he, he, he certainly seemed to be utterly, utterly fearless. And, and, and frankly, I think fearlessness is, is infectious or, and, and as I would argue, can be taught sort of the art of fearlessness. But when there were air raids, Churchill was more than likely, more than likely to go up on the nearest roof to watch right. that air raid and to bring people with him, including staff. So that's the kind of leader, leader he was. Yeah, I, I've I've actually been to the 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 bunker, the which they've now expanded to a nice museum in London. Yeah. that was there for him, and uh, and of course then to, to read that um, he wasn't going to be very excited to spend that much time there because he was going to the rooftops and stuff. Yeah, he only um, spent, he only spent three nights actually in the Churchill War Rooms. War Rooms, yeah. Um, one of the things that that fascinates me, um, and I, I don't maybe you could talk a little bit about this as a source, is the extent to which we, 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 have, we, we have some real-time information on how people responded to his speeches and so forth through this uh, project of mass observation. I, it's something I first learned about reading uh, Britain's War by Daniel Todman, a, a book about the home front and describing this mass observation phenomenon. Um, 
or I guess it was a sociological project. But yeah, yeah. can you just describe that a little bit? I don't, and I don't know what today's equivalent of that would be. I mean, maybe it'd be social media or people's Google searches. <laughs> but you know, talk yeah, about, yeah. about that because that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so mass observation. Um, was a social sciences organization that was founded before the war. <clears throat> the point being to, to create, as its founder said, to, to create a, a social psychology of ourselves. The idea being uh, to recruit hundreds of diarists to just write about daily life in Britain. You know, real, just the quotidian things. In fact, one, one way that the, the, the diarists recruited to do this were to kind of <clears throat> sharpen their skills was to describe things on their mantelpiece. You know, is that, it's that kind of daily personal detail that was supposed to go into these diaries. Well, so here are all these diarists, you know, keeping their diaries, submitting them to mass observation for, for analysis. And then the war starts and many of these diarists continue Perfect. to keep their diaries. What a tremendous resource. One of my favorite diarists <clears throat> of this mass observation group, young woman, um, Olivia Cockett, who is, um, she is uh, a, a clerk for Scotland Yard. She is dating an older man. Well, he, he's a married man. She's in this affair, love affair with, it, with, a, with an older man. Um, and, and her diary shows this, I, I think, uh, the shows in, in metaphorically what the broader culture, <clears throat> what the broader culture in Britain was, was experiencing and, and, and how, how they evolved. Here comes the Blitz, September 7, 1940. She is terrified, like, like everybody else in London. I mean, this, this is, this is a, a, a shocking thing. You know, up until then, the belief was that for whatever reason, London was not going to be attacked you know, by, by German bombers directly. She's terrified. Um, over time, um, she becomes less terrified. The, the, the pivotal moment for her is when the, the, um, uh, uh, an incendiary bomb lands outside her house. When the, when the Germans attacked at night, they would, uh, they would first, um, uh, well, simultaneously in, in many cases, but the, they would first drop a lot of incendiary bombs. These, the point being to set things on fire so that the flames would serve as a beacon for bombers to follow. Cause you know, this is, this is still an, a, a, an era when, when flying at night was best done, you know, uh, uh, with, with moonlight. And if you didn't have moonlight, you had to have these fires that, right. as, as beacons. So one of these incendiary bombs landed outside her house. She put out the incendiary bomb. She snuffed this thing out and she was so proud of herself, so elated that really suddenly, suddenly she was no longer, no longer afraid. She had, she had stood up to this, 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 you know, this, this awful assault from, from Germany. And she had, she had, you know, had the courage to do this and had the courage to put this thing out. Meanwhile, her, her, her lover became, as she's quite candid about her lover and about their sex life, actually. Um, uh, meanwhile, her lover um, became more and more fearful. Um, and my favorite moment is as, as, as the story proceeds, as, as time passes, so they're walking um, during a, as, as an air raid um, begins to, to occur and they hear two bombs falling. They have a distinctive sound. They hear two bombs falling and her, her lover shouts for her to get down, get down. And she says, not in my new coat, I'm not. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so, you know, we, we are, uh, as I mentioned, future tense, we're, we're, we're uh, usually focused on uh, our relationship to technology and the impact of technology on society. And, uh, so part of the reason I wanted to have this conversation with you, other than the fact that I'm uh, a fan of your books and a, and a history buff, um, there, there is sort of a, a future tense connection here, which is I was, one of the other things that I was really struck by reading your book, however familiar I, I, I may or may not have been with, with Churchill, is that you, you really, you really um, portray him as a, uh, I don't know if you would call him a technologist in today's sense of the word, but certainly like a tech enthusiast. And, and the, the character, Professor Lindemann in, in the book is, is an interesting one and, and his role as part of Churchill's circle. So you know, if you could just talk a little bit about that, that relationship and Churchill's relationship to science and technology writ large. Sure. I mean, clearly that, you know, whether it was radar or all the, the cryptography that we're familiar with, with the Enigma code and, you know, technology was a huge part of uh, what, uh, 
you know, turn the tide and help and yeah. help the allies and in particular the English contributions. But um, that was not something, you know, we, we think of, we have this image of Churchill as sort of like this antiquated figure from another, from the distant past. And I think even in his day, a lot of people have that image of Churchill. So he's not necessarily like technology savvy isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. But in your book, there was a, that, that was kind of an interesting theme. Yeah, yeah. Well, well for, for, first of all, he, he, he loved the idea of, <clears throat> of, of secret weapons. He was a big believer in the, in the potential for, for technology to give Britain a significant edge in terms of weaponry and so forth. Toward that end, one of the advisors he, he appointed, um, and, I, and this is another aspect of, of, of his, his, his leadership um, um, smarts, by the way, his special sauce, if you will, was that he appointed advisors that, uh, that, that he knew would give him the straight story. He didn't appoint people who were simply going to, to suck up to him and say, oh yes, oh yes, my Lord, you are doing exactly the right thing. Um, uh, Frederick Lindemann was one of, the, one of the most thoroughly disliked men um, in the government, in Whitehall, in the, the, the district of London that is considered to be the, the British government. He was, he was disliked by just about everybody, except maybe Churchill, and except maybe Churchill's wife and, and the Churchill's um, uh, children, um, because Frederick Lindemann, AKA the prof, never forgot their birthdays. But he was, he was um, shortly after uh, uh, Churchill became prime minister, he appointed Frederick Lindemann, the prof, to be his personal scientific advisor, which was a very, very smart, very savvy move. Um, because first of all, it, it, it gave Churchill an insight into you know, what technological um, um, things were actually happening within, within Britain, within the defense establishment. But also, um, it gave Frederick Lindemann carte blanche to investigate anything that he wanted to, any technological issue. Um, and this was very powerful because it assured that Churchill was going to be getting the straight, the straight story. He was going to be getting the straight story, not something that was fabricated, not something that was massaged, um, because Frederick Lindemann had this had this ability to look into 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 anybody's affairs, any any ministry's affairs, and bring back a report. To, to, to Churchill. And, and in some cases, he actually wrote his own, his own memoranda for Churchill to sign that would be distributed then to the, to, to the ministries in question. And this proved to be a very, very valuable thing. For example, it turned out that, 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 um, the, that uh, the, the, the British um, didn't really actually know how many planes, you know, no surprise there, but didn't really know how many aircraft uh, Germany had, and, and mm -hmm. it's kind of an important thing to know in terms of you know, what kind of a offensive they can wage, but also didn't know how many aircraft the RAF had. That was another, that was another issue, and that comes, that comes out in, in, in the saga as well. In fact, it was such a, such a conundrum um, that Churchill decided he would have to actually hire a, a, a criminal court judge to, to, to review the evidence on both sides. This was the judge who had actually handled a very famous um, uh, uh, murder case called the Jigsaw Murder because the bodies were chopped up into so many pieces that they had to be reassembled before they could sort of make a determination of cause of death, and, uh, not, not cause of death, but, but who the victims were and so forth. But anyway, so he actually had to hire a judge to, to, to sit in on this, on, on this meeting of the minds about just you know, statistical, um, uh, statistical assessments, you know, reconnaissance, all these other technological elements, uh, codes, and so forth, to try to determine how many planes did these people have, um, and how many planes do we have? So it was a fascinating thing. But the prof, the prof is one of those characters who who, does, who gets short shrift, I feel, yeah. in, in in Churchillian histories, and he was crucial to the story. And uh, there's also the the. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about what you said about um, Churchill's not needing to surround himself with, with uh, yes men who are going to tell him. And I, I don't know if it's, it's, there's also been sort of a, a cultural shift, but in our contemporary politics, it seems like you, you cannot have any press conference or cabinet meeting without everybody going around and thanking the, the leader for leader. Tr tremendous you know, and I, I think in, in, in the Trump administration has taken that to a, a you know, a, a completely new level. But but I think there's, it's 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 broader than that. It's it's more widespread. But I don't I don't I don't get the sense that that was, you know, when there were when there were updates about the situation, you know, on the front lines that they spent 
20, 30 you, minutes you know, thanking Churchill for his great leadership. But you know, the, the, there's an analogy that we can make actually to the contemporary situation is that, you know, I, I would argue that, <clears throat> that Anthony Fauci serves the purpose today of, 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 of Frederick Lindemann of the prop. The, the difference being that, that the current um, administration doesn't want that kind of input, doesn't, doesn't like having somebody like Fauci out there as sort of a, sort of a, 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 a loose cannon, where as Churchill wanted Frederick Lindemann to be in everybody's face. He did, this is what, this is, this was his mandate was to get out there and cause trouble. And he did in spades. And I, I want to remind people that uh, you can upload questions on the Q and A feature and we're, and we're starting to get some, um, but, but don't forget about that. Um, and then on this, on the sort of industrial side, Eric, you had uh, Lord Beaverbrook who was sort of the, the production czar. And he was sort of, he's an interesting character too that I, that I feel um, might, might be a little bit more familiar. But, um, and we had analogous characters on in the, once the US entered the war, uh, I forget his name, but a former CEO of, of GM was, was brought in for a dollar a year famously by FDR to sort of ramp up production. And yeah. Beaverbrook, I guess, <clears throat> even if they didn't know they had, how many planes they had, the RAF realized they needed a lot more. And so he's brought in for that. And that, that was another interesting relationship. Well, yeah, so Lord Beaverbrook is another key element of the story. I mean, I, Beaverbrook is, is, has, you know, obviously there have been biographies of him. But again, I, would, I feel that in, in larger, larger biographies of Churchill, he, he tends to get sort of still, still somewhat, somewhat short shrift. But he was crucial in this era. And the, the wonderful thing about, about um, well, first of all, he was, he was widely hated as well. <laughs> um, and, and in that case, even Clementine Churchill did not like Lord Beaverbrook. But immediately after Churchill became prime minister, he appointed Beaverbrook um, the Minister of Aircraft Production and set up an entirely new ministry, the Ministry of Aircraft Production. Um, because Churchill recognized something early on, um, and that is, Churchill and, and, and his military advisors recognized something early on, and that is that if, if they were, if Britain was, was ever to re be able to repel um, a, an invasion, it would require first, it, 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 it would require that they hold the, that the Luftwaffe at bay. If the Luftwaffe got air superiority, the potential for an invasion would be, would be very, very big indeed. So, and he realized also though, that the only way to, to prevent Germany from getting air superiority is through the use of fighter aircraft to take down their fighters and take down their bombers. So he appoints Beaverbrook to be a minister of aircraft production with the express goal of, 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 of ramping up production of, of fighters. Fighter production was already starting to increase, but on a very sort of programmed level, Churchill recognized much more had to be done. Britain needed vast numbers of fighters to repel this, this assault. Beaverbrook steps in. He'd never met, built a, a, an, an industrial object before. He was a newspaper baron. Newspaper. His, his, his smarts were in with newspapers and, and, and ramping up circulation and, 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 and knowing the dirt on everybody else. Um, so now suddenly he's put in charge of this, this Ministry of Aircraft Production. And, and the whole point was to shake things up. Churchill knew that this guy was hated. Churchill also knew that he was incredibly energetic and, and incredibly smart, and that if anybody could do this job, it was going to be Lord Beaverbrook. And he did. He came through in, 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 to an incredible degree. Maybe not as incredible as he would like people to remember, but in, to an incredible degree and really kind of saved the day. So there too, yeah, it was, a, it was a, it's not exactly the technology side, but you know, he really, he really understood not the manufacturing of aircraft, aircraft, he understood the motivation of people. And one of the right. most interesting things that, <clears throat> that he did um, was he made sure that, he made sure that um, uh, uh, RAF pilots, actual pilots, people who actually had their wings would visit aircraft industry, um, aircraft manufacturing companies to talk about what the planes were doing and how, how valuable it was that they were doing it. Another thing you know, here too, he was sort of, a, a, a very good at the, the power of symbolic uh, of, of gestures as well. Um, he would, uh, they would bring uh, German aircraft, if they were shot down, um, they, would, they would put them on the back of a truck, and right. drive them through towns, you know, as if they're just simply reclaiming this aircraft and bringing it back. But the point was to show people, we've done this. We brought down this, this German aircraft, which is another sort of, sort of clever little, little detail. Um. 
One of the things that we, it's also easy to forget is the longevity that Churchill had on the historical scene. I mean, he doesn't become prime minister until 1940, May 10th, uh, as you say. And by that point, he's how old? He's... When he becomes prime minister, 65. Okay, 65. Um, but he had been this, you know, uh, famous character even in his youth because of his experiences in the Boer Wars and his writings about it. And then he is uh, in a in a high position in the cabinet during World War One, um, with some controversies involving Gallipoli. But um, there is a yeah, question. Well, he gets he gets kicked out of, of yeah. his post as as First Lord of the Admiralty because of Gallipoli. Right, right. I was I was I was putting it nicely, but you're right. <laughs> um, the, the, but I, I, so Amy Jackson um, has a question. She's in the audience and she's asking uh, an interesting question about, so, so I bring up the longevity, longevity because of course, um, Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty um, in during the time frame, I think, of the sinking of the Lusitania. And so he is a character in, in Dead Wake, your, your book yes. about the Lusitania, which, which was also amazing. I highly yes. recommend it. Um, and so Amy's question, uh, was did your research for this book change the image of Churchill that you had then and that you portrayed in, in Dead Weight? And I, went, and I was wondering if that's one of the things that led you to want to write a, more about this, this character. Well, so the answer to your question is no. The answer to her, because that, that's a very interesting question. You know, I, I in, in writing about Churchill in the book about the Lusitania, I, I actually, I liked, I liked Churchill even then. I mean, I, I know he screwed up with Gallipoli. Um, um, and that's uh, you know really really a, a, an interesting story in and of itself. But but I think rather than changing my perception of him, it sort of it 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 fleshed out my sense of of, of what Churchill was was really all about, um, and and made him seem to me a a, a, a richer his experience during World War One um, informed my research. Uh, in, in this current book, by by making him seem more of a nuanced um, character, you know, a, a, a flawed character, which he was. He was deeply flawed, and and make no mistake that that you can criticize Churchill um, for many many things, especially in his in his in his, in his post post uh, World War II roles, and and also in 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 some of the things he did prior to you know he, he basically was he was he was an arch imperialist yeah. um but during this period during this period um he was in fact the leader of the moment the, the man man of the hour and and his experience during world war one was was I, I think important to 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 know because you know he 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 screwed up he screwed up big time in, in in that that prior experience and now here he was coming into coming into this role um, during this this even uh, well not, I think actually one could argue it's a graver apparent apparent existential threat um, and um, you know how he then you know how he mustered the confidence to do so I mean was is a tremendous tremendous story but you know the two the first did not lead me to do this at all. So. Right, gotcha. You, you, you talk about his, him being a flawed character and, and him being sort of an arch imperialist. And I always get the sense, and this really comes across uh, in the Roberts biography too, that you know, even, at, even in, his, in his days, he seemed somewhat, his way of thinking seemed a little bit outdated and, and overly nostalgic. And, um, you know, and in the 30s, he is, I think he's he's seen by many people as 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 a bit preposterous and over the top and too melodramatic and and uh, you know and partly it's because he's beating the drums on the threat that the Nazis pose and, and other yeah. people want to have a more temperate but but I I do wonder if when when you think about the kind of leadership that we need when we are fa when our a democratic society is facing a an existential crisis um, is is the the persona and the traits that you want, that you need in a leader, maybe maybe they're different from the kinds of leaders and traits in your leaders that you want in a time of normalcy. I mean, in that May 10th, 1940, they turned to Churchill, who was sort of, you know, this this larger than life and, and, and character that was sort of, had been so out of the mainstream until sort of events caught up. It's like they have no more choice in a way and then one of the things that's just so poignant about the whole saga of the war 
from the British perspective and, and the Churchill uh, protagonist is that he gets voted out of office, you know, right. two months right. after <clears throat> VE Day, a month before uh, the war ends in Japan. I mean, that's yeah. just, it's so unimaginable <laughs> to, to us reading and, in, in, you know, to, to us learning about this and, you know, 80 years on, th that that would happen to, to somebody who, who sort of carried the country through this experience on his shoulders. And so it, was there a realization even then that this guy's great for an emergency, but this is not the kind of, this is too much, there's too much melodrama in this, in this type of leadership for, for peacetime. I, I don't know about the melodrama part, but, but, but clearly, clearly what, what, what brought Churchill in was a, was a profound sense that, that Neville Chamberlain was not up to the task. And clearly <clears throat> the, British, um, uh, the British public at the end of this, at the end of the war, just before the end of the war, had, had the, 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 the same count, but contrapuntal feeling about Churchill, that, that while he was great you know, during the war, confident, strong, um, and, 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 and really able to rouse the public with his rhetoric, maybe, maybe that's not what we need now. Maybe now we need a little bit more stability, a little bit uh, you know, to, to manage the post-war era. So yeah, I mean, I think that there are people who are suited to certain kinds of leadership, just as there are, I mean, there are, there are certain generals who are suited for desk jobs, and there are certain generals who are suited for being out there on the battlefield. Um, and so, yeah. Right. Um, there are a couple of questions here about uh, Coventry, which are which are interesting. It's something that you hear off and on about, and I, I'm not clear exactly on what's urban legend and what's truth. Tom Herman asks, Eric, a movie indicated that Churchill was told by the decoders at Blenchley about an impending attack by Germany, and that Churchill <laughs> chose not to warn the target. I think it was Coventry, he says, because that would make the Germans realize their codes had been cracked. Any truth to that story? You know, not in the case, of, not in the case of Coventry. Nothing that I found. The the story of Coventry is is this, um, uh, because thanks to thanks to code breaking and, and deciphering German uh, uh, Luftwaffe communications, it was known that there was a big raid that was coming. It was it was called Moonlight Sonata. Was the was the code name, but. But it wasn't at all clear where this thing was going to go. The presumption was um, among the among uh, uh, air intelligence um, was in British air intelligence. The presumption was that the attack was going to be on London, uh, and I thought it was going to be on a particular particular night. It actually happened a, a, a one night earlier. Churchill was a report was done full of detail and that was meant for the for the prime minister it was given to him apparently in uh, 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 according to one account given to him in the um, in the car as he was leaving town to go to to go to checkers and it was so alarming um, uh, suggesting that there was this massive massive raid that was going to occur um, against london that night he came back, and in fact, he was on the rooftop of, of one of the, I think it was the Air Ministry building. He was on the, on the rooftop waiting for this huge raid um, that, that he feared would come, but it was not coming to London. It was coming to, to, to Coventry. So did he know this raid was going to, to, to come? He did know a raid was coming. He didn't know, and he, he, he presumed that the target was going, to be, was going to be London. He had no idea that Coventry was going to be involved. And, and also on, on the subject of, of Coventry, which uh, you describe the aftermath very uh, movingly. Uh, David Peters, uh, thanks you for joining us. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and he says he found um, uh, your description of that aftermath of the bombing of Coventry apropos to our current moment, particularly the speech by the bishop at the first mass funeral where he says, let us vow before God to be better friends and neighbors in the future because we have suffered this together and have stood here today um, uh, from writing this book and your many others, what morals, beliefs, principles have you found have been critical in times of despair and tragedy? I guess what would be the modern day equivalent of that bishop's speech, asks David. The modern day equivalent of that bishop's speech, even though we've, that we've heard thus far, well, nothing, frankly, from the federal government, but, but I would think, I think that, um, I think that, uh, you know, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo, um, one thing I've been impressed by in his daily briefings is his emphasis on, on you know, yes, things are, are improving now, um, rates of hospitalization and so forth are, 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 are coming down in, in New York State, 
but it's always very, very careful to emphasize um, how, how, how tragic, how the, the disaster of all these deaths, night after night after night. He he's never has let us all forget um, uh, the fact that you know what, what even though we're, we're we're in this you know this this race now to reduce this the the, the virus to to make it subside. You know he, he he's always reminding us of the grave losses that we are still we are still experiencing. He never loses that that perspective, and that's that's a very important thing. Yeah, another aspect of, of, of leadership, and then and Churchill had this as well, is is you know, first of all, I think to be a be a, a, a power to be a not powerful, but to be an effective leader, I think you have to have a a, a strong, well balanced moral compass, and one ancillary effect of having a strong moral compass is that you also are able to to experience and express empathy, and that's something that. That Churchill was very, very good about. He can, he could manage both. He could manage waging war, which he loved. He, he was be the first to confess that he, he loved the thrill of war, um, but he was also deeply empathic and and and, and understood on, on a very on a very personal level what the people of Britain were were, were experiencing. That speech by the uh, by the the bishop that. Coventry was to me, I think, very, 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 very moving um, uh, and very, very Christian in the in the best sense. Um, uh, I, I found it very important to to make reference to that. So we're saying a lot of nice things about um, Churchill in terms of his rising to the occasion in, in that first year and meeting the moment. Uh, but Janice. Um, asks a question. Uh, she writes in, uh, the book gives very little attention to any unhappiness in the population with Churchill and his handling of the war. Was there indeed very little of this? Well, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't go through all the home intelligence reports now and tell you what I found, didn't find, but the overall sense that I got was that people were quite satisfied with, with Churchill. Um, uh, but there were moments um, when they were less satisfied. It depends on, on which moments you want to talk about. But the, generally, the, the overall, the sense that I got about about the public and Churchill from home intelligence reports and from these mass observation diaries was that people were very impressed with him, and 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 they they were very very satisfied and happy with his with his leadership. There are of course critics, but you know, that, well, that seemed to be the override sense. Yes, and certainly in a time of war, when you're facing an existential threat, there's a rally around the flag effect. You mentioned, uh, and obviously over time, it it people adjusted and, and as we talked about four years later, voted him out of office. But you, you were talking about 9-11. I think we can forget that two months after 9-11 in November of 2001, uh, George W. Bush's approval ratings stood at 91% um, here in the US. And you know, so um, that kind of effect is uh, and obviously in a global pandemic with all of the the, the yeah. current environment, it's not necessarily going to play out the same way. No, it, to... is, it is also the case, though, uh, one important thing to note also about Churchill is that one of the reasons he became prime minister in the first place was because he had overwhelming public support, overwhelming public support. And this is something that, that, that the, the king and the, and, the, and, and the, the rebels actually had to account the, the parliamentarian rebels had to acknowledge that he had this 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 great reservoir of popularity and it, and it and it persisted through this at least through this period a couple of people i, I didn't want to turn the, get to this because um a couple of of people watching and, and this was my reaction to uh felt like mary churchill's diary was an amazing addition to your book uh somebody's asking uh can you talk a little bit about the diary has this been used before in other books uh <clears throat> Yes. So, um, first of all, Mary Churchill is my favorite character. Um, the diary, I think, I think was a tremendous asset in working working on this on this this book. Um, when I got permission to use it um, from her her daughter, um, I was at that point one of only two people who had actually looked at this this diary. So this diary wow. is really very new in terms of new material <clears throat> and her perspective. <clears throat> and the thing I loved about this diary was that first of all, she's she's a very very smart, very very um, uh, astute and accurate observer of of everything around her. She adored her father and would talk of would grieve She's for him. Seventeen at the time. Seventeen right? at the time. She would she would grieve for him when he came under came under criticism, which he did periodically for 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 perceived perceived errors. 
Um, but she she was a wonderful observer and all that. But the thing that the thing that I really really loved about Mary was that she she was exactly the kind of um, presence or, uh, or, or 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 observer that I was trying to trying to 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 corral for for this book for for this lens that I was trying to open on that particular period. So how they got through this thing? How did they do this on a daily basis? Because in addition to being a very very astute observer. I mean, very smart and very articulate, you know, observer. She also was, after all, a 17-year-old girl who really liked to have fun. Yeah. And, you know, there are references to, sn to snogging, snogging in the hayloft with young RAF pilots, you know, going to parties at RAF bases. I mean, this was a lovely counterpoint. And also talking about her, you know, she and, she and a friend of hers uh, at, at, at one point resolved that they were going to, to learn all the Shakespearean sonnets. One, 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 per day during that summer. They did okay at that, but didn't, I don't think they completed the mission. But anyway, so Mary Churchill turned out to be this really wonderful, charming, charming character. I think she makes the book, honestly. Yeah. Um, so lastly, uh, we have a question from Victoria who talks about how she's struck by Churchill's appreciation and understanding of history, something that maybe he did share with uh, the previously referenced Abraham Lincoln um, and so you could say a little bit about that, but also the, her question is, uh, what are you, uh, as, as somebody who appreciates history, choosing to read uh, these days while you are uh, homebound in, in, in New York? Well, I will tell you that, that when, it comes to, um, when it comes to reading for, for pleasure, or in this, this particular time, I, I read totally for escape. I mean, I'm, 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 a, I, I'm, I'm doing the literary equivalent of cowering. I mean, like I love thrillers. <laughs> I love thrillers. You know, I just, although I have to qualify that a little bit. I just finished reading. I just finished reading um, uh, William, Go William Golding's um, uh, The Lord of the Flies. I'd read it before, but I just, I reread it for, for whatever godforsaken reason. But, but I, it, it, it actually turned out to be a really great comforting kind of read for this period because you know honestly i'd rather be sequestered in my house now under the circumstance i am than to be on that island with a bunch of primal schoolboys hell bent on killing each other so anyway it was it actually turned out to be kind of a very interesting read. but i read for i read for distraction i read for for I, I, I mean, I love a good, I love a good, uh, I, I love a good thriller. You know, one of my favorite things that I just read recently was uh, The Couple Next Door by uh, Shari Lapina. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Terrific, nice, really, really sharp, kind of edgy, edgy thriller. So I, 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 I read totally for escape. That's, that's my mission right now. Great. Well, Eric, this is, uh, this has been such a pleasure. The hour flew by. Um, you know, on a, on, a, on a personal note, I also, <laughs> I wanted to mention that um, I met, you know, I've, I've read a lot of your other books, I, as I'm sure a lot of us watching have. Um, and uh, in the Garden of Beasts um, was, was really, I had sort of a, a slight personal connection to it because my father, I grew up in Mexico and my father who was, I was, I'm a mutt. My mom was American, my father was Mexican. When my father was going to night school in Mexico City in the 50s, um, he got, he was offered an uh, like administrative office job um, by somebody named Alfred Stern and got to know Martha Dodd. And when I was a kid, I would hear these, these, these interesting, interesting stories about these people. That, I mean, he was like a, yeah, he was, a, he was studying law at night and working for the, in the, during the day for this character who it turns out was of great interest to the US government. And, and to read your book where Martha Dodd is the daughter of the US ambassador in Berlin 20 years before that, and, and quite the character, um, it, it, it was an interesting corroboration and, and interesting and, and postscript on these stories that I would hear from my father. So interesting, so, interesting. So I thank you for that. And maybe at some point we can, we can have a sidebar on that. But thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for- um, Yeah, thank you. For calling it, for watching this, this latest Future Tense um, social. We do these Tuesdays and Thursdays at uh, four o'clock Eastern. Please uh, check out our, the events page in New America or Slate um, and, and, and come, come join us for more of these. And Eric, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.